The Radical. Fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, and individual rights. This is The Yaron Brook Show. All right, everybody, welcome. Welcome to Iran Book Show. And uh, thanks for joining us this evening. Special show, special edition of the Iran Book Show. I was not planning to uh, do a show today. Uh, but, you know, the financial world was calling. And tomorrow, tomorrow we're talking to Amesha Dalja. We're going to be talking about how to evaluate medical studies. So that'll be at 11 a.m., East Coast time, 11 a.m. East Coast time tomorrow, Saturday, will be Amesha Dalja, and we'll be going over a number of medical studies, and and uh, he, he will tell us why, you know, what to look for in terms of what, what looks valid and what looks not so valid. And then um, Sunday, we will be uh, we'll be doing our big Q&A with uh, $100 supporters and above, and um, Super Chat. So I figured today we'd better catch up on this insanity. And I'm not talking about what's going in the stock market. I'm talking about all the commentary on what is going on in the stock market. Alicia, Saturday is tomorrow. Alicia's in a different part of the week. So um, we're going to be talking about the stock market. We're going to talk about... uh, some basic concepts. So one of the things that was shocking over the last few days, and I don't know why I still get shocked because this has been going on forever, um, is the ignorance. And, and it's one thing to be ignorant. I'm ignorant of a lot of things. Uh, but it's another thing to be ignorant and to pretend that one knows something. And really, the, the amount of ignorance on Twitter, on Facebook, on everywhere has just been astounding. Uh, So I figured I better get, and and among people who follow me, among people who uh, follow me on Twitter, follow me here, so people I assume who know something about me, but um, just stunning how ignorant, emotional, uh, uh, unmoored from reality, so many people are. So I figured... Let's just do some basics. We're going to talk some basic finance here. Stocks, right? How they trade, how they clear, short selling. Now, you don't have to know all this stuff. And it's fine not to know all this stuff. And it's fine to be ignorant of this stuff. But then you probably shouldn't go on Twitter and claim to be an expert and have strong opinions about things you know nothing about, which is everybody. And then the experts, of course, are all biased, and then the politicians. Uh, never let, never let a, a, uh, a crisis go to waste, so the politicians are just now, they're just salivating at the opportunity created uh, by, by uh, this, uh, this uh, it's not even a crisis, this uh, storm in a teapot. Um, and uh, so they're just salivating about the new regulations and, oh, and they're going to bring all these uh, hedge fund guys in front of Congress and they're going to love that. So I'll be there when the hearings happen. Don't worry, because, uh, you know, somebody has to defend these poor hedge fund guys. We'll talk a little bit about the history of hedge funds and, and we'll, we'll talk about um, what's different about hedge funds. What makes a hedge fund a hedge fund versus a mutual fund? versus a, a regular investor. Is there anything that makes a hedge fund different? So those are kind of the topics. We're going to talk about what's happened as well, the prices, the everything like that. So before we get into all that, a few things I want to make clear, and some of these I'll repeat. One, uh, well, maybe not a few things. One thing at least. <laughs> One thing at least. Um. All of my opinions expressed on this show are mine alone as Yaron Book of the Yaron Book Show. They do not reflect anything about, you know, my financial activities, my professional life as uh, in the financial sector. They do not represent my firm. 
They do not represent uh, anything like that. In addition, nothing I say here should be construed as encouraging you or discouraging you from buying a stock or selling a stock, from getting involved in the financial sector or not being involved in the financial sector, or doing anything. I'm just commenting, and it is not meant to constitute any kind of advice or recommendations or anything like that. Uh, and is that it? <laughs> Again, and I am not here in the capacity of a finance professional, which I am, but I'm not here in that capacity. I'm here in the capacity of a commentator, of a pundit, of, a, of the Iran Brook Show. All right, I think we got that clear. One of my partners was, was, was a little worried, and justifiably so, uh, by something I said uh, a couple of days ago. All right. One other thing I wanted to say, because I just find it funny. I think it, it, it's finally, I don't know, finally hit me today that I'm never going to have, I, maybe never is a long word, it, it's incredibly unlikely it's incredibly unlikely that i am going to have tens or hundreds you know hundreds of thousands of followers tens i already have but hundreds of thousands or millions of followers it's just not likely to happen on every issue it seems on every big issue every big cultural issue it seems even the people who follow me today Almost nobody agrees with me. You know, and, and I started, I, I, I try to remember when this first began, but it, you know, really first began with my reaction to 9-11. Maybe more people were on my side on that one, but then I remember getting into massive fights with people, people who are supposedly on my side, about Ron Paul, and, and people telling me, Ron Paul's going to win the election. There's no question Ron Paul is going to be the pres next president of the United States. It reminded me exactly of the people who told me that Trump was going to be president. Uh, the, 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 even if he lost to Biden, he was going to be president on January 20th. And then just on every one of these major issues, whether it's Trump, it's just stunning to me how there's no, there's no reason or rationality. There's no... There's no focus on facts. There's no, let's think about what's going on without rushing to conclusions and without going by emotions. And it, 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 my audience just doesn't exist out there. You guys, and, and some of you are not my audience. Some of you hate my guts and still listen to the show. But those of you who, you're in the tiniest of tiniest of tiniest minorities. And I don't see that changing. I just, I, I go on Joe Rogan, I'll go on Joe Rogan, I'll get another 1,000 people, I'll get another maybe 10,000 people, but it's not going to grow exponentially. There's nothing I can do that will, no position I can take that will not mostly alienate people, it seems. We'll, we'll see, but that's what it seems like. It was, it's truly been stunning the last few years, I think, with, with Trump, really, it hit home. How much of a minority I represent, how much of a of a different way of thinking about the world. Um, the people who I have around me, the people who work with me, the people who follow me are relative to the rest of the world. So it's, it's, um, ugh, it's tough. Somebody asked me to react to Tucker's bid on GameStop. So this, he has a sec segment. I'll, I'll look for it. I'll, I'll look for it and maybe do it next week. Uh, I haven't seen it, so I can't. I can't react yet, but I will look for Tucker Carlson's comment. I'm sure it's bad. I'm sure it's bad because he has he has an understanding of economics and a finance of of a five year old, an emotionalist five year old, likely to have tantrums. Okay, so let's talk about the stock market. Let's talk about the stock market. We'll talk about games. GameStop and all of this. So let's start with the basics. Let's start at the beginning. 
What is a stock? What is a stock? Well, a stock is an ownership contract. A stock is a claim on the residual earnings of a firm. It's a claim on whatever's left of the earnings once everybody else is paid, including your debts and your employees and everybody else. Right. And it's, we live in a limited liability world, so it's finite in terms of the claim the company has against you. All it can claim is your initial investment. You can't lose more than that if you buy the stock. A stock is an ownership claim on the assets when, when, the, when, it, when a company goes bust or if it just liquidates. The debt holders get everything that they are owed and whatever's left goes to the shareholders. Well, what is this claim worth? What is this contract worth? How do we know what a stock is worth? Well, a stock is worth whatever the claim's value is. And what is the value of this claim? Well, what is the potential for this company in the future to generate excess cash? That is cash above and beyond what it owes its employees, its suppliers, and its bondholders, its debt holders, its banks. What is left over? What's left over belongs to the stockholder. And therefore, the stock today is the value of all that excess cash into the future. And the way, the way in which you value a stock as you look, as you try to project what is going to be the profitability, profitability in an economic sense, the excess cash after everybody else is paid, what's going to remain for the shareholders into the future? And one takes all of those cash flows and one discounts it to today. That is, one takes into account that this happens in the future. A dollar in the future is not worth the same as today, both because of inflation both because one just has a preference to, for money today because you can do stuff with it. So the opportunity cost, if you will, the opportunity to consume, the opportunity to make alternative investments, and because of the riskiness, the fact that I might not get that dollar. So one discounts all those cash flows to today, and you get a value, and that's the value. Now, we're not all going to agree on what those cash flows are going to be in the future. We're not going to agree on the discount rate. We're not going to agree on the risk level. That's why in the marketplace, people come up with different values for the stock. And that's why we trade. I think the stock is worth more. You think the stock is worth less. I'll buy it from you. We'll both win in, a, in an ex, in a ex ante sense, in a, in a sense of right now. You get, you get compensated for your belief and I, I get compensated for mine by getting in the stock. So stocks are these claims against future cash flows. Those future cash flows might manifest themselves in dividends or they might be retained by the company and invested to generate even greater, hopefully, cash flows in the future. But that's where the value of a stock comes from. And again, there's going to be disagreement. There is no right price for a stock in a, because nobody, nobody has certainty about the future. We can probabilistically estimate it, but we're going to disagree about those probabilities. We're going to disagree about the cash flows. We're going to disagree about the risk. We're going to disagree about the timing. So we're not going to agree on a price. And that's why we trade. If we all agreed, if everybody agreed, if there was a definitive price at any given moment, there would be no trading. It'd be no trading. So that's what stocks are. Now, in the old days, 
Oh, so somebody's asking, does uh, the stock market concretely impact the company? Well, yes, in a, in a few ways. One, well, initially, when you do an IPO, initial public offering, when you, when you go onto the market, you sell the market stocks, that initial money comes to the company and serves as capital that then it invests to grow and to expand and to build the company. So that is, that is the first way in which the stock market concretely impacts the company. The second way is, in the future, you might go into the market and sell more shares. And if you do that, the price at which where the market has valued you will determine how much money you can raise. That's true of the initial public offering, and it's true every time you go into the market to raise capital. But it's more than that. The market gives managers signals about how well they're doing. Signals that if managers are smart, they pay attention to. Sometimes the market can see a risk to your business that you cannot see. So if the stock is price suddenly goes down a lot, a good manager stops and thinks, why? What are they seeing that I am not? What is going on that I am missing? Important signal. If the stock market goes up, it might be because you're doing a great job. Or again, there might be a market opportunity that the market sees that you should see. So that's another way in which the market impacts the company. A fourth way, I think we're in four, is that other capital providers to the company, like debt, banks, bonds, which are loans, look to the stock market to see what the market thinks of a particular company. So part of their evaluation is the stock market. So again, if the stock price is going down a lot, banks are less likely to lend you money. If the stock market is going up a lot, banks are more likely to lend you money. So again, it affects the ability of a company to raise capital, to raise money. So those are the ways in which the stock price is relevant for a company, affects the company concretely. And maybe I missed something. Hopefully, I'll catch on to it. Please you, you keep asking questions relevant to what we're talking about, right? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in asking any questions you have about stocks in general, uh, financial markets in general, stock markets in general, uh, short selling, uh, the situation right now with GameStop or any of these companies, feel free to jump in with questions. Of course, the ones that have big dollar numbers associated with them will get priority. All right, so that's what stocks are. Now, how do stocks trade? Let me just, uh, yeah, these are some good questions. How does stock trade? Well, in the old days, in the very old days, hundred, you know, when the stock market first existed in the 19th century, um, you basically, you know, one person had the shares, and if I wanted to buy the shares from him, a shareholder, so a shareholder would come to, I guess, under this tree across where Wall Street is today, and um, they would say, hey, I've got shares I can sell, and I would go there, and I would take cash and give him cash and get the shares. Now, that's not very efficient, not very productive. So all kinds of mechanisms have evolved. Uh, you know, initially there were people representing me, my broker. So, you know, you started having brokerage houses. So I would ask my broker to go and buy me 100 shares of GameStop. The broker would charge me a lot of money to do this because it was work. They would have to call or telegraph a market maker. A market maker sits typically in New York at one of these exchanges. And the market maker now sees, oh, somebody in Puerto Rico wants to buy 100 shares of GameStop. 
they would go into the marketplace onto the floor of the exchange and say, somebody wants to buy 100 shares of GameStop. Anybody want to sell him? Sell 100 shares? And there would be some negotiations about the price. The market maker would take a cut. And, you know, both parties would then go to what's called the clearinghouse. The clearinghouse would then make sure that my money arrived, that the share arrived, it would swap them and send them on back to the broker, my broker, and the broker of the person who sold the shares. And everything would be settled. And this could take a while. This could take days, depending on technology. To this day, it takes two days to settle every stock transaction. Two days to settle every stock transaction. Right. Now, that's how it used to be. And indeed, before 1970, somewhere between 74 and 76, I'm not sure of the exact date, it, it was either Gerald Ford or Jimmy Carter. Before that year, stock commissions... The amount of money a stock broker could charge me was set by government. Yes, was set by government. There was a fee. They could charge you X percent or flat fee, but the government set those rates. Government set those rates. In uh, 1974-76 or whenever it was, they deregulated. They got rid of that regulations. And as a consequence, brokerage firms could set their own commission fee. But it's still true that up until a few years ago, and commissions, by the way, dropped dramatically, just like airline prices dropped dramatically. So commission fees dropped dramatically. And as they dropped, and to a large extent they dropped, whoops, thank you, uh, to a large extent they dropped because it, trading stocks became easier, Simpler, electronic, faster. You could easily see the bid ask. The bid ask spread is the spread where the market maker is making a market, right? He buys it at the low price, sells it at the high price, right? It's not an exaggeration. The only thing that counts in finance is to buy low and sell high. So a market maker, the person who is actually making the transaction, and sometimes holding the stock himself, buys low, sells high. That's the bid ask spread, the spread between what you bought, what the market maker will buy it and sell it at. That all became electronic. That all became almost instantaneous. That became super fast to do and super cheap to do. Telecommunication cost dropped dramatically, and suddenly, the broker wasn't really doing much and was having a harder and harder time explaining why they needed their exorbitant, very high fees. So there was competition in brokerage, and fees went down and down and down. To the point where somebody like Robin Hood, and many others, Robin Hood's not alone, are offering you to trade in markets for free. Now, when anybody offers you something for free, you have to ask yourself, but, 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 but wait a minute. You've got costs. You have expenses. You have employees to pay. You have to go through the process of actually doing the trade. How are you surviving? Where are you making your money from? You're not making it from commissions anymore, so where are you making it from? And here's where it starts to get complicated. So what is happening is, and this is my understanding, and if somebody knows better, and, I, and I'm not, 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 not an expert on the mechanics of, of how these things trade. I'm not an expert on the details. I think you'll get the big picture. I'm not going to get into all the details. It's very, very technical. But I'm going to give you the big picture, particularly as it relates to what's going on right now with GameStop and these other companies. Why? So I'm going to focus on the details that matter with regard to what's going on. 
So one thing that happens is, is you aren't going to explain PFOF. I don't know what PFOF is. You're going to have to spell it out for me. Um, so one of the things that happens is when a, when a broker offers brokerage, fee, uh, brokerage services for free, it has to make money somewhere. Where does it make the money from? Well, here is where it get, starts getting interesting. So what Robinhood, for example, does is Robinhood has a deal with, let's say, a, 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 one of these uh, market makers, these people who, if you're, if you're buying stock, they will sell it to you and then they'll go and buy it somewhere if, or they'll have an inventory and sell it to you. If you're selling stock, they will find somebody uh, to buy it from you, somebody to sell it from you. They're the, they're the market maker. They make the market. They facilitate the buying and selling. Well, the market maker makes money. And the more transactions flow through their shop, the more efficient they can be and the more money they can make. So uh, the market makers have an incentive to have a lot of volume flow through them. They make their money on the volume. So what Robinhood does is it basically commits to trading, having all its trades or a certain percentage of its trades grew a particular market maker. And the market maker gives Robinhood a cut of what it makes on those trades. So the bid-ass spread that the market maker is making, a piece of that, a piece of that is given to Robinhood for the ability to trade Robinhood trades. And all these brokers have deals with market makers. Now, it happens that a big chunk, over 60% of the trades that Robinhood does, are made by a financial firm called Citadel. You've probably heard of Citadel. Now, Citadel is an interesting case because Citadel started out as a hedge fund, and we'll talk about what a hedge fund is in a minute, started out as a hedge fund, but has evolved into a broader kind of financial institution where acting as a hedge fund is just one of the many things that Citadel does. One of the things Citadel does is it makes markets. It matches buyers and sellers. And this is where all these conspiracy theories are because Citadel both has a hedge fund arm and has a market making arm. And the, so this is how the story is going right now on social media and in the press and in the financial press even. The story is this. That Citadel sees the deal. Whoops. All right. We got a, we got a movie sponsorship. This is, I think, my first. Thank you, Shazbat. Movie sponsorship. All right. I've, I've never heard of this movie. Real Genius from 1985. Uh, I will review that movie. Excellent, excellent, excellent. All right, um, where was I? So um, this is the story as it's told. Citadel gets the trades from, um, from Robin Hood. But before it executes them, before it executes them, in a sense, its hedge funds seize those trades. So it knows what's coming, which gives them, in a sense, inside information into what is going to be traded. And then they use that information to make money. And this is called front running. Now, front running in the regulatory world in which we live today is illegal and could destroy a firm like Citadel. And has destroyed firms in terms of wiped them up by the government. So it's, uh, Citadel, if it's doing this, would be doing something illegal. And could, you know, executives, I don't know if they could go to jail, but certainly the, the, they would get fined huge amounts of money and it would, could destroy the company. I think it's hugely unlikely that Citadel is systematically doing this. Again, because 
they'd get caught. I mean, the SEC has become, I hate to say this, the SEC has become really, really good at catching these kind of things. So that's the accusation against Citadel. No proof, as far as I know, that this is happening. Uh, it, it, you know, we'll find out. I guess there's going to be investigations. The SEC look into it. But I doubt that is going to happen. But other than that, the story is, and this is the next part of the story, that Citadel has an interest in some of the short sellers, maybe even the Citadel hedge fund is shorting, we don't know, GameStop. So Citadel had an incentive to stop the trading yesterday so that the stock would go down, so that the short sellers would make money. But again, no evidence that it actually happened. And there's plenty evidence as to exactly what did cause the stopping in trading yesterday. Because yesterday, something unusual happened. Not unheard of, but unusual. And what happened yesterday is that a number of brokers, not just Robin Hood, a number of brokers stopped trading in at least three of the shares that have been uh, the focus of uh, this Reddit mob. Why? Did the brokers want to deny the ability of their traders to trade? Probably not. No, although, again, think about this. The brokers don't actually make money off of you as a trader. They don't care that much. I mean, they do make money off of you, sorry. They don't make directly off of you. They make money on the other side. So, this, you know, the story... So the story, that's why the story was that Citadel did this. But Citadel wants those trades because Citadel is making money off those trades. We'll get to the, 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 the funny part of this is that all of this done in the name of destroying hedge funds and going after Wall Street and going after rich people is actually making rich people richer. It's making hedge funds richer. It's making Wall Street richer. But we'll get to that in a minute. So what stopped the trading yesterday? What stopped the trading yesterday are the clearing houses, the clearing firms. Let's go back a step. After the market maker makes the trade, these, this has to clear. Money has to show up. The stock equivalent of a stock certificate has to show up, and they have to change hands. That is done by a, clearing, a central clearinghouse. It's called DTC. It pretty much does 90 plus percent, I think, of all the clearing in the United States. DTC clears all these things. And facilitating DTC, it's done through clearing houses. There's competition in clearing houses. I don't know, there are 10 of them, 15 of them, something like that. These clearing firms, because this transaction is sitting out there for two days, the money is not there, the certificate is not there. So there's uncertainty about whether this will actually happen. It almost always does happen, but there's some uncertainty. So the clearing firms have to put up collateral to DTC so that it will clear the transaction. So that if the party, for example, that's buying, that's putting up cash, doesn't show up with the cash, or the equivalent of showing up with the cash, then the deal still happens. But what is used as the collateral, and then the clearinghouse goes to find that investment investor and sues them and tries to get the money from them. I don't know if you, I hope you're following what I'm saying. But it's complicated. And again, I'm simplifying. This is a simplified version. Now, imagine what happens when suddenly you get millions and millions and millions of trades in stocks that don't typically trade much where a lot of the buyers and sellers are retail investors that nobody really knows, nobody could really vouch for, nobody exactly understands. The clearing, the central clearing house got nervous. The DTC got nervous. And they dramatically raised collateral 
for deals involving these stocks. The clearinghouses have little capital. Way too little capital to be able to provide collateral on the basis of what DTC was requiring. So the clearinghouses basically called up the brokerages and said, you can't trade these stocks today. We need to raise capital. We need to get collateral so that we can actually clear this. Otherwise, we won't clear it. And your trades will be bogus. They won't mean anything. All right, so that's what stopped the trading. At the same time, the clearinghouses were on the phones, dialing up all their bankers, trying to get bridge loans, trying to get short-term loans, short-term capital, to be able to provide the collateral to resume trading, which they did today. Trading resumed today. Why? Because they got the capital. Not because AOC tweeted, not because Ted Cruz tweeted, not because Citadel cleared them, but because the clearinghouses managed to get the capital to backstop the trading. Indeed, I think overnight, Robinhood itself had to raise capital because it was being stretched. And it might be helping, in a sense, the clearinghouses clear all this with the new capital that they have. So this had nothing to do with Citadel. Now, Citadel, somebody uh, writes, didn't Citadel invest $2.75 billion into hedge fund Melvin Capital? That's the main hedge fund that was shorting GME, not proof, but emotive. But yes, but they invested the 2.75 after Melville had already exited the GME trade, after they'd already left that short. They invested 2.75 when Melville had lost uh, what I heard potentially 70% of its assets on that trade and maybe a few other trades, and we're exiting that trade. So in a sense, Citadel was recapitalizing Melvin to go, because Melvin has a great track record up until this week, and it's recapitalized them. I'm sure Citadel got amazing terms and is going to make a lot of money off of this investment, not a bailout investment. So again, it's not clear that Citadel had had a motivation. Now, it could be, that Citadel's hedge fund was short, uh, GME, we don't know. But, and that would have given them an incentive. But again, that's not actually what happened. Right? It's not actually what happened. What happened was the clearing houses raised collateral obligations. Nobody could afford to trade these stocks. That's what shut it down. Mr. Plotkin. Mr. Plotkin runs Melvin, and he was a protege of the guy who runs uh, Citadel because he used to work at Citadel. You know, they have a relationship. A lot of these people have the relationship. Uh, All right. So that's the mechanism in the background, that nobody talks about, because it's complicated. It's much easier to have scapegoats. It's much easier to just blame Citadel and the cronies and and all this stuff. It's just not true. Just not true. All right. Uh, Let's see. What else? All right. Let's talk about why you mentioned Stephen Cohen, 0.72 when they were, oh, forget it. Um, Let's talk about short selling, and then we'll talk about hedge funds. Uh, Short selling is you short sell a stock when you think the stock is more expensive than it should be. When you, well, two reasons you would short sell. You, you could short because a stock because you're using it to hedge. What does hedging mean? Hedge is to protect you against the market going down. So imagine um, imagine you um, I'm, I'm trying to find a 
a good example of a um, of a hedge. Let's say you are invested in Apple, but you're worried that I don't know some new products are going to come up about and destroy the market for cell phones. I'm inv- I'm making something up, which is pretty silly. But but anyway, let's let's assume that, right? And so you might hedge your investment in Apple with an investment in, with a short on Samsung with the idea that if cell phones the whole market collapses, then yeah, you'll lose money on Apple stock, but you'll make it on Samsung. You'll make it back on Samsung. Now, if Samsung was more expensive than Apple uh, from a valuation perspective, then that would make sense even if cell phones didn't collapse because you would say, you know, Samsung, Apple, I, I estimate that Apple's phones are better than Samsung's. Why is Samsung trading at a higher valuation than Apple? I'll short Samsung. I'll go long Apple. And as the two prices converge to valuations, because I'll make money. So shorting can be used as a hedge or as a, in a sense, a relative value play. It can also be used as a you know, opposite of investment, right? As, as a um, way in which to, you know, to uh, make money on companies that you think have a bleak future, that you think are overvalued by the market. I mean, I told you last time that I thought Tesla was overvalued. And let's not get into that because... Again, I'm not making stock recommendations. I'm just using this as an example. Imagine I believe that Tesla's overvalued, that the next, and for whatever reason, I've done my, I've done my, my research, and I think there's competition out there, and the competition is just going to crush Tesla, and it's going to happen within the next 12 months. Then I would short Tesla. And if I'm right, when the competition arose... Tesla stock would go down because suddenly people would realize they're not as profitable. They're not going to be as profitable in the future as the market expected. Their stock would go down a lot, and I would make money. And I'll explain how you make money on a short in a second. So it's, it's about making money off of stocks going down. And sometimes by shorting it, encouraging it to go down. Now, a lot of people say, oh, but those evil hedge funds, they, they, they short a stock and then they release all this negative information about a company. Well, they release their research. Just like when they buy a company, they release all the positive research on the company. Nobody has to pay attention to it. Nobody has to. Nobody's forced to use it. Nobody's forced. And indeed, most market participants take the research from the people who are short a stock and take the research from people who are long a stock and maybe take some independent research and they come to their own conclusions. So for example, take GameStock. GameStock is a brick and mortar company in a digital world. It's a company selling video games when video games are moving to the cloud. It's a company that probably did well in the 20th century and doesn't have a future in the 21st century. Some short sellers saw this probably two, three years ago and started shorting them and probably made a lot of money as the stock came down, and it did. Think about GameStop as Blockbuster. It's a dinosaur. Somebody a long time ago thought Blockbuster was the best investment in the world and probably made a lot of money buying the stock. But then somebody at some point noticed Netflix. And they were pretty early on. And they shorted Blockbuster. And by shorting it, they helped move the stock price down. By moving the stock price down, Blockbuster became less attractive. Less capital went to it. Less stores were built. And more attention was played to Netflix and other streaming services. That's how capital gets reallocated in the marketplace. And that's the essential 
essential function of stock markets. It's to allocate capital. It's not to be a play thing for, you know, for bored people sitting at home. It's supposed to be an allocator of capital. So Blockbuster stock went down. The short sellers made money and they helped bring it down. And that's a good thing because capital was allocated away from Blockbuster, which is what the shorts contribute from the perspective of productivity, of, of you know, proper allocation, productiveness. So short selling is incredibly productive. It's often visionary. A lot of times short sellers discover fraud in a company. And they take a position in it. They put their money where their mouth is. They let the world know and then the world estimates. Is it really fraud or isn't it fraud? It was just a, a recent case with this, with a multi-marketing, with a, a, a multi-marketing company, and the short seller said, "No, this it just doesn't add up. None of this makes any sense." And people said, "No, you're full of it," and he lost a lot of money because the stock went up, and then ultimately was completely vindicated and made a fortune when the stock tumbled. But it adds to the information embedded in stocks. It adds to the efficiency of the stock market to have short sellers. We have to have short sellers. Now, let me add to that, that it's very difficult to short stocks. You can only short stocks under certain market conditions. It's very risky to short stocks because your loss is unlimited. Regulators make it particularly difficult to short stocks. During the financial crisis in 2008, they banned short selling for a while in many countries. Herbalife was the, was the, the, the company, that's right, Herbalife. Short selling is heavily regulated. Yeah, Jimbo asked, didn't George Soros short the British pound? Yeah, famously, George Soros shorted the British pound and forced the British town to basically massively devalue, which was right, which was the right thing. He valued the British pound correctly when the governments of Euro the European governments and the British government were trying to prop it up. He forced it to, 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 to adjust to proper market prices. Short selling is risky. It is heavily regulated. It is difficult to do often because there are all kinds of rules about when you can and cannot get into a short all of which, most of which I don't think would exist in a free market. That's another thing about whether the stock market's a free market. It's far from being a free market. So short selling is very challenging and good for those who do it in the sense that they force the repricing of overvalued assets, which is healthy and good for the economy. I'm not going to get into options today. You know, enough is enough. You know, we've, I'm already going even a, almost an hour, and I haven't got through most of this. Now, a lot. So, how do you how do you uh, short? The way you short, I explained this the other day. But the way you short is you borrow a stock. Let's say I'm um, I'm the shorting. I'm I'm the hedge fund that's shorting. I'm not, but let's say I am. Again, this is not me as a professional. This is me as the Iran book show. I borrow. Let's say Daniel has uh, some stock in uh, Game Store, and I want to short Game Store. So I go to Daniel's broker, and I say, uh, "Will you lend me Daniel's shares so I can? S uh, will you lend me Daniel shares?" And if Daniel signed when he had a broker's when he signed his broker's agreement, when he checked the box that I allow my shares to be lent out, then the broker will say, "Yes, I'll lend them to you." So then I borrow the the stock from Daniel, and I sell it. Let's say the stock is at, right now, it's at $400. I take the stock from Daniel, I sell it for $400, and I put the $400 in my pocket. Let's say in a week, Daniel comes to me and says, I want my stock back. Then I have to buy the stock in the market and give it back to Daniel. Now, if, 
the stock has gone up in value, let's say it's $600, then I've just lost 200 bucks. I sold it for 400, I now have to buy it for 600. But if it's gone down and it's gone down to 200, I now buy it for 200, give it to Daniel, I have lost $200. So that's how basic short selling works. Now, there have been accusations that the uh, that there was 140 percent short positions on the stock of uh, GameStop. That is, there was, in a sense, to simplify, there were more shorts than there were stocks. How can that be? There's something called naked short selling, and that's where I sell a stock, but I don't really have it. That's illegal. You can't do that. Then how did we short 140 shares, 140 shares, let's say, of something that only has 100 shares? All right. You might want to get a piece of paper and a pencil out. This is not very complicated, but it's just a little complicated. Because now instead of two players in this game, we're going to introduce four players in this game. Try to follow me, guys. Daniel has the stock. I borrow it from Daniel. Right. I borrow it from Daniel and sell it. I sell it to Kyle. Kyle has the stock. So does Daniel. They both have a claim on exactly the same stock. Right? We didn't invent a new stock here. But I borrowed it from Daniel and sold it to Kyle. Now Kyle can lend that stock to Scott, who can then sell that Scott, who, can then, who then sells that stock to Stephanie. And now I've got three shares shorted for one share in existence. One share in existence. So 140% is unusual. It's very high. I think Melvin was stupid to be in such a position. Right. So again... I know it's of the float, but the point is still the same, right? The point is that I could short the same stock three times so I can get to 140% without naked shorts. Come on, guys. The, get the point. Stop focusing on the terminology and the technicalities. I'm trying to keep it simple. The point is if you have 140% of the float, doesn't require naked shorting because I could short the same stock over and over and over again. The mark, I mean, in the marketplace, not me specifically. Now, all of that gets unwound, and it's very similar, by the way, to fractional reserve banking. The same dollar gets deposited in multiple banking accounts. I don't have time now to go through it, but it's the same thing. And it's why you can have much more money out there than the actual claims that that money represents. So, no, there was no naked shorting. At least there's no evidence of naked shorting. So, uh, you know, Tobias says, or somebody says, I'm wrong about, uh, about Wall Street Journal. Wall Street Journal reported, I'm not wrong about Citadel. So Wall Street Journal reported Citadel invested in Melvin Capital Monday. CNBC reports that Melvin closed their shorts on Tuesday. Okay. But they closed their shorts. They closed their shorts at a gain or a loss. When, and when did the market shut down? On Thursday. So by Thursday, Melvin was out, was out of the GameStop investment. So by Thursday, if Citadel's only exposure to GameStop was through Melvin, by Thursday, It was out. Now, while it takes the trades two days to settle, 
The price is not determined on settlement date. The price is determined when you close out the position, which is two days before. So Melvin got prices on Tuesday. Citadel, therefore, had no exposure, zero exposure through Melvin to GameStop by Thursday. Citadel had no incentive to stop trading on Thursday because prices were set on Tuesday. So give me a break, people. <laughs> this stuff, this is the way it worked. Right? This is the way it worked. Sorry, I, I, Tobias, I didn't, uh, I, I thought it was you, but I don't know who it was. I can't remember who asked that question uh, about the Wall Street Journal. Oh, it was Ron. Ron W. asked it. So now, you know, if you want to blame Citadel for the shutdown, you have to show some evidence. But there's plenty of evidence to show that it happened because of the clearinghouses. Okay. All right. Where else? Where were we? So that is short selling. Pretty important stuff. Pretty valuable. Right? Pretty important. Pretty valuable. What is what are Tobias's complaints? Yeah, I know it wasn't the entire. I know it was just a float. I know it was the float. Um, I don't didn't want to get into the difference between the float and the outstanding shares and all of that. That is not the point. The point was to illustrate how you could get have more shorts than actual stock and why that was not an indication. That was not an indication of naked shorts. There's no evidence of naked shorting. All right. I, and I, there's still a whole section I want to tell you about how all this would have played out in a free market because none of this would have happened in a free market. Now, let's look at hedge funds. What are hedge funds? Well, hedge funds were really started, uh, and it's, uh, I don't know if it's the 60s or 70s, but hedge funds have been, been around for a while. But hedge funds were basically funds that were unregulated. They were, in a sense, outside of the regulatory system. They were allowed to do, for the most part, anything they wanted in terms of buying and selling and shorting without disclosing to regulators, without having to abide by regulations. There were a few standards they had to abide by. For example, they had to, um, they couldn't take money from anybody. They only could take money from sophisticated investors. Most of the money came from what are called institutional investors. Pension plans, uh, uh, in, uh, insurance companies, uh, other investors. Right? So hedge funds used to be, not completely, but mostly unregulated funds, like mutual funds. But one of the problems with mutual funds, most, most of you are probably familiar with mutual funds, one of the problems with mutual funds is mutual funds, you're not allowed to pay the, um, hedge fund manage, the mutual fund manager based on their performance. So you can't pay them a, a percentage of the profits. Right? You can't pay them a percentage of the profits. And that creates incentive problems. The very nature of hedge funds is that a big part of the compensation of the manager of your money is based on performance. So there's, a, there's a, the, the, the famous uh, uh, way in which to think about uh, the way hedge fund managers are compensated. It's not true anymore, but this was in the past. It's 2 and 20. So hedge fund managers typically used to get 2% of the money under management every single year as a fee income pay for expenses and all of that, and then they would get 20% of the profits. So 2% of the fees, 2% of, 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 of the total invested capital, right? 
of the, in the fund and 20% of the profits every year. And if they lost money, they would not get any profit that year. And they would have to, before they got profit in the following year, they'd have to make up the losses from the previous year. So very much incentivizing managers to make money because that's how they got rich. Hedge fund managers get rich by making their clients lots of money. They don't make a lot of money for clients. They cannot get rich. Now, starting in the 1990s, starting in the 1990s, hedge funds started to be regulated. Slowly, systematically, more and more and more and more. Really after uh, 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 long-term capital, which was a big hedge fund that kind of blew up and got bailed out. The first time a hedge fund ever got bailed out, not by the Fed, but what the Fed did is it kind of encouraged other hedge funds to bail them out. It was orchestrated by the Fed. The Fed got involved for no objective reason. It was Alan Greenspan. That was 1998. But really, they were starting to get regulated already then, and then after that, just more and more and more regulation. To the point today when hedge funds are heavily regulated by the government, They're, um, uh, they have to disclose their positions. They do. Uh, you know, they, they are... Um, the amount of forms and compliance, and it's just unbelievable. Unbelievable. Just recently, the SEC uh, brought out new regulations about marketing, what, how, how, how hedge funds can market and how they can't market, and 500 pages, 500 pages of regulations just on the marketing of hedge funds. They're still compensated based on performance, like the 2 and 20. It's not 2 and 20 anymore. For the most part, it's less than that, but that's the kind of parameters that engage in. Okay, again, I want to remind everybody, uh, I'm doing all this not as a financial professional. This is, uh, this is me as a commentator, as a pundit, if you will, uh, as your Ron Brook show, not as a uh, finance professional. Nothing that I say is supposed to indicate, uh, this is part of the SEC regulations, is to indicate my recommendations to buy, sell, transact, get involved, do anything in the financial markets. Just my opinions, take them or leave them for whatever they are, but not advice, not in my capacity as a financial guy, finance guy. All right, uh, we have about 250 people watching, 133 likes. Please like the show before you leave. It's incredibly valuable on the YouTube algorithm. It gets a lot more views if we have a lot more likes. I see five people didn't like stuff I said. I, I was just giving facts, so I'm not sure what they didn't like about the facts that I was giving. But we got some thumbs down. I'm sure we'll get some more now. But uh, yes, nothing I've said so far has been opinion. Stuff I've said so far about short selling stocks, about uh, markets, about hedge funds. Just facts, guys. Just facts. Um, now, shorting is very regulated. Hedge funds are very regulated. Hedge funds the short are very regulated. It used to be, good old days. Yeah, the SEC is a disaster. Uh, all right, let's see. Now, individual investors. I want to make a few comments on individual investors because this relates to Reddit. And I don't know how long we're going to be here because I haven't even got to the Super Chat question. So let me get, let me get this about individual investors. Investing is a sophisticated activity. It requires real knowledge. It requires real thinking. It requires projection about the future. It requires knowledge about risks, knowledge about competition, knowledge about how trades are done, knowledge about the world, knowledge about industry, knowledge about technology, knowledge about the particular industry of the company you're investing in. It requires massive amounts of research. And there are many, many professionals who do this. Hedge funds, for example, that's what they do. They have 
It depends on the size of the hedge fund, but there are people who do research, who dig deep, who try to get data that other people don't have. Not inside information, God forbid, but data. It, they run sophisticated algorithms. They come up with new ideas on how to think about markets. They do original finance research. That's hedge funds. And then they trade based on that information. And by trading, whether they're buying or shorting, by trading on that information, they are making markets more efficient. They're taking their knowledge and embedding it into the prices. Hedge funds are some of the most important, if not the most important, actors in the marketplace who are constantly buying and selling stocks in order to reflect the best information they have about the future. Now, you're an you're a individual, and you want to invest in stocks. Well, you can go and do the research. And look, the only way you can make money, and when I say make money, it's make money above what kind of the market return is. The only way for you to make money is to do better than these hedge funds, in a sense. It's to say, no, 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 you've got GameStop all wrong. You don't get it. They're going to go online, and they're going to have these amazing profit margins. Why? I don't know, because there's no way. I don't understand the GameStop business model, because if they go online, they'll just be competing with everybody else online, and their profit margins will shrink even further. So there's just... But let's assume you... So you go and do the research. But when you're trading in the market in individual stock names, you are basically assuming that you can do better than the professionals. You're smarter. You know more. You have a better algorithm. You have a better computer. You, you, you know a lot more. And 99.99% of you don't. I know it's hard to hear. I know nobody wants to be told they don't know. But you don't. There are thousands of really, really, really smart people, some of them with PhDs in physics and mathematics and finance, who are studying this every day and devoting all of their resources full time to figuring these things out. Figuring these things out. And You think you can beat them. I mean, great. If you, I mean, you can. You can try. But just like it's likely that you'll leave your money in Vegas because the, the odds are in favor of the house, the odds are in favor of the professional investors, not because they're cheating, not because it's rigged, but because it's their full-time job, and that's all they do, and they do it really, really well. And if they don't, they lose their jobs. So individual investors, for the most part, it's futile. Now, so the best way for an individual investor to benefit from the fact that stocks represent growth in the economy and represents profit-seeking and wealth creation and all of that is, uh, you know, to buy a mutual fund or to, or to invest in a hedge fund or to invest with the professionals. But even there, nobody would suggest that you invest in one hedge fund. You invest in a whole variety of hedge funds. You want to be diversified. The way for long-term making money in the markets is to be diversified. You reduce the risk and maximize your return for the amount of risk you're willing to take. So how do the guys at Reddit do it? Well... A number of things. One is luck. People get lucky. And they make money. And I'm sure you all have had this happen where you invest in a stock and it went straight up, made a lot of money, and you thought you were a genius. And you tell that story to every single friend of yours, everybody who listen, friends or not friends, you will tell that story too. But the many, many times you invested in stocks and they went straight down, that story never gets told. Never gets told. So, of course, all we hear 
are the stories of the people who made money. All we hear are the stories of maybe people who didn't make money, but the stories where they did make money. They leave out the other stories. Some people just get lucky. And then there are, I guess, we discovered the last few weeks that there are mechanisms by which you can make a lot of money, almost as a sure thing. Yeah, it's just like gambling, Matt, absolutely. Most day traders who make money are making money like they would gambling. They're lucky. But there is one mechanism by which you can maybe make money without it being gambling. And that mechanism is through collusion. Now, I'm not against collusion. I'm fine with collusion. I'm not sure the SEC is going to be fine with collusion. But me, I'm fine with collusion. You could get all your buddies, and if you have tens of thousands of buddies, like a Reddit community, and you get them all excited and in a frenzy, and they all jump into a stock, and they drive that stock price way up, you, who got in there early, and who are smart enough to get out in time, you are going to make a bundle. You are going to do phenomenally well. And you could do this over and over again, as they have. And again, those participants in the Reddit collusion, in the Reddit mob, who get out early enough, will make a fortune. That'll be offset by all the people they'll have brought into the stock at higher and higher valuations, who will get slaughtered when that stock tumbles down to its actual value. So uh, GameStop right now is at, uh, I think, 400, 300 and something. I didn't look this afternoon. It was up today 80% or something ridiculous like that. It's worth, from what I've read, somewhere between 10 and $40. I have no idea how much it's worth. I, I don't have any claims. And it's going to come tumbling down to 10 to 40. It might take two days. It might take a month. It might take six months. But somebody who's buying it at 300 is going to land up owning something worth $10. And yes, some of the Reddit crew, crew are out already, and they made a fortune. Now, I suspect that as they continue to trade that fortune, they will lose it again. But, you know, they might get be able to really be good at creating these mobs in a serial fashion and be successful at it. Some day traders invested very early in, uh, in Bitcoin and did phenomenally well with it. I know a number of people who are independently wealthy just off of their trading in Bitcoin. Good for them. Good for them. Maybe they know something I don't know. Maybe they know something the market doesn't know because of the unique nature of Bitcoin. It's er the early adopters probably understood it better than anybody else and gained from it more than anybody else. So uh, individual investors are not important in a marketplace. What's important in a marketplace, in a properly functioning marketplace, is informed investors. Investors that have educated points of view about a particular stock, who disagree, but who by trading infuse the value of the stock with information. So what would happen in a free market? Well, in a free market, there would be a much greater variety of different funds than there are today. It's not clear we'd have a category of mutual funds and a category of hedge funds, but maybe we would. It's not clear who would invest in which category because we wouldn't have regulators telling us. Exchanges would actually be, f be owned by private ent entities. There wouldn't be massive regulations about collateral, about clearing, about market uh, making, about brokerage. Who knows how the market would have evolved? But this I can assure you. I don't think in a free market 
exchanges would tolerate the Reddit move, mob. I think in a free market, they would have been shut down much earlier. Not because of collateral, but because in a free market, the exchange has reasons to want trading to be at least semi-rational, semi-informed, at least reasonable, and not completely nuts. And it's a private enterprise, so they can decide who's allowed to trade, who's not allowed to trade, and when to stop trading. So who knows what would have happened in a free market? But the idea that free market means that you can trade any stock anywhere at any time, no matter what, is bullshit. Did I say bullshit? Yes, I meant bullshit. In a free market, just like today, but more so, there are many private, uh, uh, private entities between you and making a transaction that might not want to deal with you, not, might not want to let you do the particular deal that you're going to do. So it's not clear that in a free market, the exchanges would have allowed you to do to just rush in by the hundreds of thousands into a stock with no rationale. I don't know. Maybe they would have allowed it. Maybe they would have not. But the idea that you have somehow a right to trade in anything you want at any price you want, whenever you want, it's just not true. Market makers can say, no, I'm, I'm shutting down this stock. I, this, this trading is nuts. I don't get it, and I'm stopping. I'm not trading it. Brokers could say, I'm not dealing with certain customers. You don't have a God-given right to trade stocks. Any more than when you went under that tree in, uh, uh, in Wall Street in the 19th century and you said, I'll pay you 100 bucks for that stock. And the guy says, I'm not selling it to you. I don't like you. You just look off. I just don't want to sell it to you. And that's okay. That's a free market. You are free to make an offer. The other party is not free, not forced, not coerced to accept. He is also free to reject you. Free market doesn't mean it's free, no cost. Free market doesn't mean you get to do whatever the hell you want. You don't, because there are other players. Free market may, means you can put your best estimate forward and see whether the market responds or not to it. Did, in the current conditions, did the, guy, did the Reddit mob have the ability to squeeze the shorts? Absolutely. Absolutely. And Melvin and the other shorts in GameStop made a strategic mistake by overshorting that stock. At some point, it's called a crowded trade. When everybody is in a particular stock, I don't think you should be there. It doesn't make any sense. So yeah, they went and do I think they're heroes for doing it? No. Do I think they're doing anybody a favor for doing it? No. Do I think Melvin are bad guys for shorting GameStop? No. Am I, you know, they got squeezed. They lost 70% because they made a mistake. Mistakes happen. And they should pay for the mistakes they make. Did, uh, have, um, have the Reddit mob provided value, value to the marketplace, value to the economy, value to any of us? No. Huge disvalue. You've got stocks all over the place who are mispriced right now. Mispriced. That's not good for the market. The purpose of the stock market is to allocate capital. For that, prices need to be Efficient, need to reflect the best available information, at least to the extent that they can. What the Reddit mob did is move those prices away from efficiency. Away from efficiency. Not towards efficiency. Naveen said he disagree. I'm curious what you disagree with. What I said you disagree with. 
Is GameStop worth $300 a share? No. It's worth one-tenth of that. So by driving it to $300 a share, they did a disservice to the markets. They did a disservice to the economy. They did a disservice to all of us. What's the value they created? What is the value they created? Now, I know what many of these leftists and libertarians think the value they created. They screwed Wall Street. They screwed Wall Street. Is, uh, no. The share is not worth what somebody is willing to pay for it. Shares have a value based on what they can produce, what they can bring, and they cannot get the cash flow. Now, it's true. You can play, you can play the game of, is there a fool bigger than me? So it's, 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 if I buy it at 300, maybe somebody will buy it at 400 for me. But it's only worth 30. This is not subjectivism. It isn't whatever you feel like. The Redditors did a service by shorting the crowded shorters. Market will be more efficient for this. Maybe in the long run, um, shorters will be more hesitant to go into crowded trades. Maybe that's a good thing. Eh. And, it, it, you know, marginally better, if at all. If at all. And in the meantime... They're creating havoc, and they're creating havoc well beyond this, the, the, the stocks that they're in right now. They, they're causing short sellers all over the marketplace to cover their shorts. Stock prices are going out of whack because of them. For how long? Who knows? So no, th there's no great value. Now remember, what they claim the value is, yesterday or the day before, whenever it was on Twitter, uh, Peterson, the, the libertarian guy who ran for Senate somewhere, said, no, oh, the reason we're doing this is to burn the system down. We want to destroy Wall Street. And this is my last point, and then I'll do the super chat. Who's, what is happening to Wall Street right now? Is Wall Street losing money because of the Reddit mob or making money because of the Reddit mob? Making money, huge amounts of money. They're making money market-making the, the gazillions of transactions that are ha ha happening. They're making money in the clearing houses. They're making money investing with the mob. How, do you think the prices went up just because of the mob? Or did some hedge funds enter in, write it out, and then leave? They're making money in every single direction. And when? When? This stock ultimately comes down to $30 a share, which it will, which it will. Who's going to make money? Well, the people right now who are shorting the stock, and there are plenty of people shorting the stock right now. So Wall Street's not going away. Wall Street is getting stronger. Wall Street is getting wealthier. Wall Street is making money, huge amounts of money, off of the trades that Robin Hood is sending them. It's raking it in. So no, I mean, if this was the beginning of the revolution, you guys are nuts. Yeah, it's, I was Austin Pe uh, Peterson uh, from Missouri who uh, just, he just wanted to see it burn. All he wants to see is he wants to see Wall Street burn. What do you think? What, I mean, to all the libertarians out there, the anarchists out there, what do you think will rise out of the ashes? What do you think will rise out of the ashes after it burns? Libertarian uh, heaven or a statist hell? Much worse than what we have today. Revolutions don't just happen because you burn stuff. Well, they do. Good revolutions don't just happen in a positive direction. Uh, cost of borrowing is very high, true, but the um, 
the upside is massive. And if you have the capital and the patience to get into all these stocks and short them and sit it out, that's great. It's already having an effect. Citron Research is discounting short selling research. It's stopping its, its uh, 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 short selling research publish publications. Now, that, by the way, is what? Is anti-efficient markets because their research was valuable, helped other firms, helped individuals. Now they will continue to short, but they'll keep the research to themselves. They won't publish it anymore. Again, this is bad for the market, and it's a consequence of what is happening. Somebody says that I look more hip wearing headphones. Maybe there's a ploy. That's a ploy you can try to attract the younger generation. I, no, I figured out that there's just no way I'm going to attract the younger generation. I, I'm just not nihilistic enough. What's common to all my opponents, oh, not all my opponents, many of my opponents, but these mob opponents, these rabid, passionate opponents, is their nihilism. Or their tribalism, nihilism and tribalism. Nihilism and tribalism right now are dominant. Dominant. And, you know, that's what holds back the show. That's what holds it. Yeah, I know the 18 year olds, here's a 20 year old. Uh, there are some, most of my audience uh, is 25 to 35. That's the biggest age group of my audience, 25 to 35. Second is 35 to 45, and then 18 to 25. But of course, 18 to 25 is fewer years as well. But here we go. We've got an 18-year-old. We've got a 19-year-old. We've got a 20-year-old. We've got, oh, but we got a 35-year-old. Yeah, 35 is normal. That's like, yeah, most of my audience. And then we got a 71-year-old. I get some, get some over 65 as well. Oh, I've got somebody who wa has been watching me since he was 20 and he's 30 now. I don't think I've been doing this for 10 years. Here's an 18, 18, 25, 42, 29, 27, 18. We got a lot of um, teenagers today. Surprising. Look at this. Wow. 54, 60, 21, 24, 38, 20, 174. Yeah. Christopher, you wish. I wish you get to 174. 32, 18, 32, 25, 40, 44, 27, 38, 23, 28. <laughs> okay. 26, 50, 24, 39, 23, 30, 50. All right. Most of you are younger than me. Well, that's all I can say. 16. There's a youngest member. Richie is 16. Um, 666 is the evil black cat. <laughs> all right. Let's take some of these questions. Let's see. One's re related. Um, uh, no, no can't. Um, appreciate these shows and finally going to catch you live. How much would you charge to put together a reading list for foundational understanding of economics and finance? Um, a reading list? Let's make it 500 bucks just for the, just to make it like a movie review, I guess. Uh, <laughs> thanks for smiling. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, my girlfriend and I are 21. She sometimes falls asleep, though. <laughs> me? Boring? You got to give, give me a break. Matt is five. Matt is five years old. Ask some good questions for a five-year-old. Kevin says, thank you for the inspiration, you're on. Okay. Did Robin Hood and brokers that halted GME purchases have the moral right to do so? Yes, and it's in the contract, and it's absolutely they have the moral right, particularly given that the clearinghouses demanded that they put up collateral they just didn't have. What are you supposed to do? What's the justification for that? I gave that already. There are suspicions of foul play, especially since Citadels bring significant revenue for it. Yes, there is uh, uh, suspicions of foul play, no evidence, and I don't think it's foul play. And indeed, when you talk to the CEOs of all these brokerages, they all tell the same story. Collateral, collateral, collateral. Um, Yvonne, would you recommend on hedge fund managers like Bill Ackerman who go short or long then use the media to support the position? Absolutely. I mean, I don't recommend investing in him. I haven't analyzed him and I don't make investment recommendations. But Bill Ackerman's a really smart guy and from what I can tell has made people a lot of money and from what I can tell has been right more than he's been wrong and I think has done a real service to markets. 
by identifying bad companies when people don't yet realize that they are bad. So, yes, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a, there, are also short, there are also short sellers who specialize in fraud. They have uh, forensic accountants that go into the accounting of companies and find suspicious things that normal accountants just don't find. And they do, I think, a real service to the market. So I think short sellers are heroic. They take massive amounts of risk um, and they provide a real service to the market and to the economy. Uh, thank you for this education. I know very little about the subject. Question, is fraud more difficult to expose in finance as opposed to, say, retail markets? Uh, yes, it is. Um, and, and, you know, and you could argue that we need like an SEC-like organization to catch fraud in finance because you need expertise to do it. But that's not what the SEC does. The SEC regulates markets. It doesn't catch fraudsters. Indeed, it's very bad about catching fraudsters. Uh, it's much more busy reading all my regulatory filings to catch somebody like Bernie Madoff, who wasn't caught by the SEC, in spite of the fact that a competing hedge fund kept writing to the SEC about the fraud Bernie Madoff was committing, including a detailed analysis. A detailed analysis. of the fraud, and yet the SEC still couldn't catch Madoff. Still couldn't catch Madoff. The SEC is useless at doing the one thing that they, I think, sh that in a free market, that would be their only job. And yet it's not the one thing they, they cannot do. That, 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 this SEC is incompetent to do, and I think they're incompetent to do it because we've given them too many other things to do that are illegitimate that shouldn't exist in the marketplace. Uh, all right. Um, have you seen Michael Shermer's most recent podcast with David Sloan Wilson? No. Uh, he's a biologist who recently wrote a novel critiquing objectivism. Yeah, Eckless Hug. Definitely worth looking into for nothing more than refuting it. I'll look into it, but it seems so disgusting, and Michael Shermer should know better. It, it just upsets me because these people are... People like Schumer have an audience, they have a mind, the smart people, they could help really change the world. And by not taking Ayn Rand seriously, by not really sitting down and thinking about her ideas, and challenging themselves to think about the ideas, they are making it, and then ridiculing the ideas, they're making it a million times more difficult to have an impact on the world. They are the ones that are killing our progress. You know, people like Hayek, who didn't take the time, and then, you know, undercut. It, it's, if, if geniuses like that, if really, and, and you know, if good intellectuals like that took the time and really invested and really understood her, I mean, we would shortcut our path by 50 years. Uh, what is the criteria that the Reddit mob is using to take out hedge funds who are shorting stocks? They now want to take out shorts in silver market, which they feel have been manipulated. JP Morgan have been fined in the past. Um, you know, I don't know. I think what they're looking for is vulnerability. They're also looking for a story they can sell other people on, um, on Reddit, on Twitter, on Facebook. A story that has legs in a sense that evokes emotion, right? Gets people excited, gets them motivated, can get the crowd. You, you want madness of crowds. You want a good story. And, and there was a story initially with, with uh, GameStop about shifting business models. Didn't make any sense. But it was, you, you know, it was just uh, gamers, uh, video games, um, uh, and then the evil shorts. There's a story about the evil of short sellers. And then they have a better chance of driving these up with their active options markets. And, uh, and I haven't got into options. Maybe another time we can do options. And uh, where they, the shorts have a lot of exposure. So if the stock price is driven up, the shorts have to cover their shorts, which means buy the stock, which helps the stock go even further high up. I mean, generally, my belief is the problem in the markets is there are not enough shorts. There are not enough people shorting. 
it's too hard and too expensive to short because of regulation. And in a freer market, there would be more people shorting. And therefore, Reddit couldn't get away with what they were doing because there would be constantly people shorting as they try to buy this stock. And that would prevent them from doing it. But because we restrict shorting, because of regulation, this is, again, the kind of funny stuff about, about libertarians. They should be the side on the side of those most regulated. And the side of those most regulated are hedge funds. Hedge funds are a lot more regulated than individual investors. So I think it's sexy stories they can tell, or, or some story they can tell, uh, combined with uh, a big exposure by the short positions. Do you believe the Reddit long stocks are being coordinated by a central authority? Is the stock being attacked or traded in thinly traded markets? Of course, yes, they have to be thinly traded as well. There is also more pitch to act, promote, and punishing evil hedge funds. Yeah, it has to be a story. That's a story. That's a moral story. But is it being coordinated? No, uh, but it is. It, the story was created by a small group of people that then riled everybody up, and then it became a madness of crowd phenomenon. It doesn't need one person. And then people on the sidelines, like many libertarians, who are not even in the trade, are riling them up in the, in the name of get, getting the man, seeing it burn, the evil hedge funds destroying them. That's what drives it and motivates it. So um, I don't think it's coordinated. Ultimately, it's coordinated the beginning. The beginning it has to, somebody comes up with the idea, people rally around that person. Those people put a plan together, and this looks like it was really thought out put a plan together, and then unleash the masses with a great and emotional story. All right. I'm investing 499 as an angel investor in your own book enterprises. Well, 499 is in your own book show enterprises, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, if Melvin should pay for their mistake, why is Reddit Group being dumped on? I didn't say Reddit should pay for the mistakes. I said I don't feel too bad about Reddit because they were overexposed and they made a mistake. The way the Reddit group did it and the reason the Reddit group did it is despicable. And they should be condemned for that. Um, Melvin did nothing wrong morally. They made a business error. And, oh okay, wait, they suffered for the business error. But the Reddit mob did this for no reason. I mean, I think some of the people did it to make money. They're the better people. The others did it for no reason than to disrupt and to take down Melvin, which I don't think is a good excuse for anything. All right, let's see. Um, uh, somebody asked if they can still send an email to Leonard. Yes, I think so. I'll... I'll find out from Leonard if he still wants to get them, but, but, but send it to me and I'll, I'll, I'll send it over. Uh, the guy who made the original GME thesis is not just some idiot. He is a 35-year-old financial professional. He gave a four-hour GME fundamental analysis. Yes, somebody started this, but the fundamental analysis could not have said GME is worth 300 bucks. What it could have said is if enough of us get into this, we can drive the price up because we'll, we'll create a short squeeze. That's not an investment. That is, you know, a gamble. That is a, a play. It's an educated gamble. It's an educated um, uh, speculation. It's not an investment. And, and you don't have an investment, fundamental investment thesis that ex can explain GME at 300. All you can do is have a thesis about how you can create a short squeeze and make a lot of money while doing it. Yeah, I think he did that. He convinced enough people, and he got it done. Why are some libertarians against hedge funds? Because libertarians are against anything related to the status quo. Those libertarians, not all libertarians. They're against anything related to the status quo because they didn't denounce the state. They, they, they're anarchists. They want to see it burn. Many of them are nihilists. That's what attracts them to anarchy. Anarchy is basically a nihilistic uh, uh, point of view because it's fundamentally the destruction. 
the destruction of what is, and the imposition of conditions that make it impossible to have markets and civilization. So their main focus, their main attention is on, um, really on destruction of what exists today. And of course they know, if they think about it for two seconds, that the people today would not create their libertarian utopia. But they don't care because, what they again, what they're really in it for is not the outcome of a great libertarian society. What they're really in it for is to watch the burning. Can you ask Peter Schiff to get you on Joe Rogan? I know they're friends. I can try. I'll also tr ask Lex. Can short sellers advertising their decisions be considered hostile or illegal advertising about the subject company? No, it's, it depends how they do it. If they present facts, research about what they're doing, and they're up front, they're not hiding the fact that they're also um, short the stock, then they're just providing information to the market, and the market gets to assess it. There's nothing false. There's nothing deceptive. There's nothing illegal about it. Now, if they're committing fraud, either by lying or by deceiving you in some way, then it's fraud. But no, uh, just no more than somebody who buys a stock and then goes and tells everybody about how wonderful the company is and does research showing you. All right. Uh, shouldn't the stock market be tanking as a response to Joe Biden creating so much new unemployment? Also, what is preferred versus common stock? How has Joe Biden created unemployment? Wow, that is bizarre. I mean, all the unemployment that you get now was created by, by uh, Trump. Joe Biden hasn't enough time to create unemployment. Now, he will. He will create unemployment. But don't blame him for what he inherited. He inherited an economy that was guided by Trump, not by him. So Trump is bad. I mean, Biden's bad enough without giving him the blame for stuff he didn't do. All right, um, shouldn't the ta stock market be tanking? Not necessarily. If the Fed keeps pumping money in, if, um, if uh, we keep getting stimulus, the, the, the market is not particularly good at figuring out long-term economic policy. Did the stock market um, predict the inflation of the 1970s? No. Did the stock market predict the, the Great Recession in 2008? No. Did the stock market predict... Um, the global slowdown. No. So did the stock market predict China success? No. So the stock market does things within a particular context of economic knowledge. And the economic knowledge right now is very, very poor. To expect them to be able to price a complex economic analysis of the future is, is asking too much from the markets. Why the markets are up throughout COVID why they think somehow COVID was good for uh, S&P 500 companies. It's good for some of them, like Zoom maybe, but why is it good more generally? I don't know. And, and we'll see. We'll see if the market stays high. But of course, when the market collapses, I don't think it'll be Biden's fault. I, I think the market will collapse because valuations got out of whack, and they got out of whack even before Biden came into office. Biden's not a puppet. All right, Apollo versus Dionysus, <laughs> or Batman versus Joker. Well, I mean, the mob is certainly Joker. The mob is certainly Joker. Uh, I don't know who Batman or Apollo refers to. It's probably closer to Batman. Apollo's too good for the other side. Do companies hold a share of their own stock? Yes. Um, uh, mostly uh, because they, they buy their own stock. So, uh, and that has to do with tax policy more than anything else. So uh, companies, if they have cash... And they don't have good investments for that cash. That is investments that can generate a higher return than the stock, the company stock can. 
that's the standard, right? Because if, if it's less good, then the stock price would go down when they made the investment. Those companies want to return the, 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 the money to shareholders. The money belongs to shareholders, after all. They can give it to them in a dividend, or they can buy back the shares. If they give it in a dividend, it's taxed at a higher rate than if, than if, if they buy the shares and it's a capital gains. So stock buybacks are driven by tax policies. You want to stop stock buybacks? Equate taxes between capital gains and dividends. And then stock buybacks, the motivation for them, not completely disappears. Dividends are complex instruments. If you, markets have expectations about dividends that if you increase them, you'll, they'll always stay increased. I have an academic paper about this, about dividends as signaling mechanisms, but um, I'll leave that for another time. Um, how much is GameStop going to hurt when their stock's bubble burst? I don't know that GameStop, the company will hurt much. I don't think this has affected the company itself unless the managers own stock. They have become instantaneously rich. Unfortunately, they probably can't sell the stock because, again, regulations prohibit them from taking advantage of this. Uh, so I don't think GameStop itself will be hurt by the stock market bursting. It's the people who hold the stock that will be crushed. A stock's essentially a claim on the credit surplus. I don't know what, I don't like the term credit surplus. It's a claim against the residual. It's a claim against the free cash flow, the cash flow that's left over after all debt all credit is paid off. I made money off of GME. Should I feel guilty? No. Just know that you got lucky. You know, and uh, don't make it a trading strategy. Uh, can a limit sell order remain unfilled even after the market price went above my limit? If yes, how can this happen? I don't think it can unless there's some problem with the, your trade. So I, I, I don't think so, right? As long as there are other parties to transact, it should go through. How are you helping bringing it down by shorting it? You're selling the stock. Selling the stock puts price pressure downwards on the stock. Um, aren't you just making a bet that it'll go down? No. You're, you're, well, two things. One is by selling you at the margin influencing price, right? Shorting is selling. Second, by letting the world know that you think the stock is worth less, disclosing the fact that you have a short, which the SEC requires you to do if, you know, beyond a certain amount, um, gives the market a signal that says, oh, people think this is too expensive. Maybe it should go down. That's how you make it go down. Can you explain why hedge funds like Melvin would think doing so as good for the greater economy. Well, as I said, because you want prices to reflect the best available information about them. If uh, GameStop is trading at 40 and it should be trading at 20, you want it to be trading at 20. If 20 is the price in which the best information is, con is, is embedded in that price in terms of what the future holds for GameStop, then Melvin, by helping it go from 40 to 20, is improving the efficiency of the market and making sure that capital is not allocated to game stock and therefore wasted because game stock's not worth it. It, it. it sends a signal to the banks, it sends a signal to everybody dealing with Melvin that it is in a dying industry, which it is, of course. Alf Stewart, thank you. Really appreciate the support. So Anytime you do something in the market that helps make prices more meaningful from an information perspective, this is why it's not clear that insider trading is bad. Again, not going to get into it right now, but it's not clear that insider trading is bad because insider trading embeds prices with even more information. Here's 499 to hear more of these facts that those five people didn't like to hear. Well, it's six now, but thank you. Uh, the press corp has rediscovered civility and almost, uh, uh, no, I'm going to skip that. Um, write a disclaimer on the description when you do the finance econ show. Thanks a bunch for the finance lesson. Isn't collusion 
like this, a natural response to overshorting like this, especially if markets were free. I don't think there was overshorting. I, I mean, I, 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 because I don't think anybody could have expected the mob to arise. The mistake they made was the mob. But it wasn't that they overshorted because they thought that the stock didn't deserve to go down. It did deserve to go down. It should have gone down. They should have made money at it. They didn't anticipate the mob. That's the mistake they made. They're paying for that mistake. If markets were free, there would be a lot more collusion, but there would also be a lot more shorting, and the, and, and, and the mob wouldn't be successful. The mob is individuals acting like a mob. Yes. I saw a Reddit thread with a dramatic story of how their father lost their home in 2008, and they don't care how much they lose to get revenge. Get revenge against whom? Melvin? Melvin was involved in what happened in 2008? Who are they getting revenge of? I mean, if they want revenge, they should have um, gone after and, and insisted that uh, Senator Dodd and, and uh, House Member Frank be tried for, for, the, for, the, for the horrible legislation and, and, and corruption that they were involved in that created the housing bubble that led to the collapse. Not, politicians caused the financial crisis, not hedge funds. But yes, what you saw is motivation by hate, not motivation by love or productivity or production or information. Do you see young adults armed with stimulus checking bringing irrational spending behavior into financial institutions as in the case of UBI? Yes, absolutely. Without the stimulus checks, I think a, a big part of what they're doing is, is using stimulus checks. And, and they're bored. You know, I'm not sure any of this would have happened if not for COVID. In a free market, would it be possible to have something like UBI but optional? Yeah, as long as the optionality was in paying into a fund that paid people. Sure. I think some entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley talked about doing it as, an, as a, it could be a charity. Now that I know you're taking standard oil, what is your opinion it was, what in your opinion is, was a terrible company? Corporation. Oh, there are lots of terrible corporations, or at least corporations have become terrible after a while. Um, you know, I'm trying to think. I mean, GE under Jeff Immelt. GE over the last 20 years under Jeff Immelt um, is a terrible corporation. Uh, what else is a terrible corporation? I, you know, I'd really have to think about it. Um, Enron, you know, WorldCom, when it, when it, towards the end, it was terrific in the beginning, and then it went really bad. This is information that's basically non-existent elsewhere. I agree with this WSB conspiracy stuff two hours ago. Thank you, Yuan. Sure. My pleasure. Thanks for listening and thanks for supporting. Okay, a uh, few Super Chats unrelated. Uh, hi, Yuan. I appreciate all you do. Thank you for being a key stone in my journey to becoming an objectivist. How do you not get annoyed when you have heard and refuted the same argument for the hundredth time from different people? It's always a new person. It's always a new individual. It's always a new mind. It's one mind at a time. And you never get, you know, I'm just thankful for the opportunity to try to get one mind at a time. Enron became corrupt, was good for a while, and then became corrupt. Most of these companies, if they succeeded, it's because they were good companies, and then they become corrupt. Jeff Immelt became Owen Boyle. Jeff Immelt was Owen Boyle. Um, I'm struggling to see the justice in, oh, this is a GameStop. Sorry, I skipped this question somehow. Sorry to see the justice in GameStop situation. Even if the fools who buy in late lose big, they're nihilists, pump and dumpers that are making it big uh, off of this. Where is the principle of moral is practical? Um, the principle of moral is practical, first of all, doesn't always apply in a mixed economy. Part of what happens in a mix, mixed economy, an unfree market, is you get injustice. That's one of the things that's so horrible about a mixed economy. It's unjust. Bad guys make money. I don't think this could have happened in a free market. Second, 
Mall is practical, doesn't apply to every instant. It applies to the sum of your life or, or, or the sum of the year or the sum of the 10 years. It applies to a certain summation of things, not to every instant. A, somebody can steal money and get the money. It looks, oh, he's successful. But then if you look into his soul, you discover he's not. The, the people who won money on GameStop will lose it because they're gamblers. They're not investors. Even if they had a whole thesis. Bank robbers have whole theses. It doesn't make the money, in a sense, legitimately theirs, and they know it. The Reddit revenge story is an example of the experts behind this mob, the ones who think they have outsmarted hedge funds. Yep, and they haven't, because the hedge funds are raking it in. <laughs> they made a fortune off of this. All right, was Kant an explicit egalitarian, or did egalitarian philosophy come from Kant in some indirect way. It came from Kant in an indirect way. I don't think you could say Kant was an explicit egalitarian. I don't think it was an explicit nihilist. I think the implications are nihilism and egalitarianism. That's my understanding. I have limited understanding. The pest corps have rediscovered civility and are almost docile at the White House briefing. They respect authorities when they're altruists. Give me a break. I'm sorry, you guys keep bringing up Trump. I mean, why would the press corp be civil to a Donald Trump? I mean, I think they were way too civil. The press was way too nice to Trump. Trump from day one uh, claiming that his inauguration had the most people and putting up satellite photos that actually proved that he had fewer people. And the press had to deal with that bullshit from day one. The lies, the misrepresentations, the attacks on the press, the attacks on the media, constant, unrelenting. Of course they went after him. They didn't do enough. Didn't do enough. But yeah, look, the press are all liberals. They're all leftists. So why would you expect them not to be supportive of a leftist president? Yeah, it's the TDS alert. I haven't noticed anyone asking what the difference between preferred and common stock is. Could you give a brief description of it? Yeah. Um, common stock is just plain. It's, it's simple. Everybody has the same uh, uh, terms, all the stocks. It's, it's typically what companies raise when they raise capital. They raise common stock. It's the most common and popular form, and it's plain vanilla, and everybody has the same. Preferred stock is preferred. It gives some investors preferences over the common stockholders. So common stockholder is subordinate to the preferred stockholders. So for example, founders of companies, uh, uh, venture capitalists, sorry, often get preferred stock. So for example, they get paid first, only then the common stock get paid. They might get a dividend on their preferred stock, guaranteed or accrued, whereas common stock doesn't have a dividend. They might get special voting rights. So a preferred stock is a customized contract that sits on top of a, of a common stock that gives you extra rights associated with your investment. So venture capitalists often get preferred stocks. Uh, you can also have different classes of stocks where some stocks have more voting rights than others. For example, Facebook is controlled by Zuckerberg through uh, a, a different class of shares. I don't, I don't know if they're preferred shares, but the different class of shares that gives him, I think, five votes for every stock he has. Or The Ford family still controls Ford. Still controls Ford, even though they don't control the majority of the shares because the shares they own have preferred voting rights. You can even have shares that don't have any voting rights. You can have common stock that's non-voting. Typically, common, vote, common stocks you can vote uh, uh, to appoint a board of directors or not. There's some common shares that do not have voting rights. And there's some preferred shares that have extra voting rights. So there is, yeah, I, I, I know I said bullshit twice today. Sorry. Yeah, I know. I'm... I'm slipping, but this is finance. You know, when people piss me off about politics and other stuff, I don't mind. But finance, finance, 
finance, then I get pretty upset. All right. Um, three times I said it. Wow. I have to be careful. Oh, that, that third one was what I just said. Yes. Uh, all right. So that is the brief discussion of preferred stock. I hope you all enjoyed this. I hope you learned something. And uh, my criticisms are valid. I don't know what your criticisms are. Uh, have you ever criticized banks and billionaires? Have I ever criticized banks and billionaires? Yeah, I mean, I've criticized Joe Soros. He's a billionaire. I've criticized Zuckerberg. He's a billionaire. I've criticized uh, many billionaires, right? I don't criticize people as a class because I don't believe in classes. I, I criticize billionaires all the time when they do bad things. Uh, do I ever criticize banks? Um, yeah, but mostly I think banks are the victim. Mostly I think banks are the victims because banks are the most heavily regulated industry in the world. I don't know, I don't know any industry that's more regulated than banks. Oh, I've criticized Bill Gates a lot because of his altruism, because of his lack of willingness to defend capitalism. I, I've Lots of businessmen, I mean billionaires I've criticized. But banks are, uh, banks are the victims of governments. I criticize the government. All left wing, what does that mean? All the billionaires are left wing? No right wing elites? Well, I, I've criticized Coke for not supporting the right causes. Um, there is no, I mean, uh, all the new billionaires are left-wing. That's true. But I criticize right-wing billionaires, left-wing. I, oh, I criticized Elon Musk a lot for taking money from the, for taking, for building companies to take money from the government. It's just, the whole thing is silly. All right, guys. See you tomorrow, 11 a.m. Eastern Time, where we talk to Amesha Jalja about how to, Read a scientific article and tell, at least get some sense of whether it's objective or not, whether there's actual value or not. Banks are leftists? How is that possible? You, have you ever met a banker? How many bankers are leftists? Jesus. All right. Bye, everybody. <laughs> See you soon.